This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans. Danilo's free. And he goes to get one. Danilo! First time we've seen them attack them. And there's Brandon! Well, that's what I've wanted to see Robinson do. Tyler Wadi he scores! And the sticky ground! Hello, welcome back to Red Side of the Trent, here to discuss the thoughts and uh, feelings around a big topic of recent years in Forest history, and that is our midfield. Returning guest, Mason Coy, joins me as ever. Mason, are you well? I'm good, thank you, mate. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, looking forward to being back. Um, are you, have you missed Forest since the season's finished, or were you quite happy for it to all kind of go now and the Euros kind of come round? Yeah, yeah. Um... Don't get me wrong. When that final whistle went at Burnley, I was as happy as any other Forest fan. Um, I was, I was really happy for it to end. Um, was counting down minutes and hours towards the end of it. Um, but I think, to be honest, what set me off is listening to to your pod again the other day, the the other release of it, and I thought, oh, ever since then, my mind's been all Forest. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it being back. To be honest, obviously, we've got the Euros, which is a good distraction. So. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk to you a few bits and bobs that's been like kind of circulating before we get into like the kind of golf of midfield. I, I wanted to address like some of the issues that I've talked to with with Christian and then and obviously your brother Reese and and Danny. Um, it's it's a weird kind of thing with Forest where you think, oh, hey, we'll have a quiet summer, and then and then everything else kind of starts to pile on like PSR and managerial rumors. What's your thoughts and feelings around the PSR thing and and the topic of Nuno potentially being replaced before we get into our gulf of, of our episode. Wow, it's a it's a tough one, really. The PSR it, it confuses me. I had a, I did have a conversation with you yesterday about it, and we were trying to determine whether the the twenty million we need to raise is pure profit or was it just sales. And I think my my view on it is it's just sales. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping that's the case because if it's profit, we've only got Jay Warrell really out of the the list that's been given for a fringe players. So, but yeah, I just I just want it I want it all over with, mate. Like obviously we had the points deduction last year. I was one of them that was happy to accept it and move on. And then it's it's really it's ugly head again, ain't it? Really, it's come back. I'm, I've I've just had enough of the whole thing. If it if it means selling a Murillo, uh, a Tybo, or Probably not gives like I think he's the only untouchable in my eyes. Or or a Hudson Odoi just to avoid it. I think we've just got to bite the bullet. And I've seen a lot of people say they'd rather take the points deduction. Like this this league isn't gonna be like last season. I don't think we've got the luxury of of having points to coffers and being being able to survive. I don't think that's gonna happen again. So uh, yeah, I, I think I'd like I'd like a sale to go through before the end of June and just forget about the whole thing, to be honest. Yeah, that's going to be a bit of a difficult task. I think what, as we're speaking, it's what eighteen days till June the thirtieth. So, we yes. an absolute fire sale, or Maranakis is selling a boat that's Forest owned somehow. <laughs> that, would nice. that would be nice. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if Chelsea can start selling hotels and like, and that kind of counts towards it, then why, why not? It's, which seems absolutely like, baffling to me that they can just sell hotels back to themselves, basically, because that's what they've essentially done. It's like Mel Morris with Derby in the ground. Yeah, all the over stadium again. once, mate. Yeah. yeah. Um, thoughts on Nuno as well? Like, what? Like, do you think it's 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 paper talk or or what? Um, I'm 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 unsure really. Like, there's there's a too much going on for me for it to be paper talk. Um, I think we're an easy link. Don't get me wrong. I think I think every single player we see linked with us, and there's thousands in the summer, aren't there, all the time because because of our previous. But with regards to managers, I think there is too too much too much going on for it to be false and just rumours. And from my point of view, I think it's Nuno wanting to go. I'd like to think that Forrest would be a bit more proactive. Like we've we've joked about it previously with the Martin O'Neill into Lamucci. What was that? Twelve minutes yeah. or something ridiculous. Like Forrest are usually quite active on the manager front, but that's why obviously we're putting feelers out there. So there must be something regard. Like Nuno must be looking to either get away or because 
the guys come in he statistically improved us he's improved us to the to the naked eye as well he's improved certain individuals just chris wood as an example i think he's he's been a little bit of a breath of fresh air he's come after obviously cooper who's a club legend now um so I, i'd like us to stick with him but there's obviously there's a lot of murmurings going on i don't i'm not not necessarily a fan of it to be fair especially this close to when players start returning like you'd like you'd like it just to be all nipped in the bud soon really yeah definitely and then obviously preparation for next season kind of they all factor in don't they we know how how poorly we're we were kind of unprepared but prepared last season and i think that's why like cooper ended up kind of getting the fate that he ended up with but that 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 whole thing with nuno and and Cooper kind of comes into this because last season I think there was a clear difference between the first half of the season under Cooper and the second half of the season under Nuno especially with our midfield because we went from a from one shape to another for, for to, to begin with in this conversation I want you to I want us to go through a bit of a review of of those players that did play in midfield so I'm looking at the the usual suspects of of Ryan Yates Nico Dominguez uh Ibrahim Sangare Danilo, and I suppose you could kind of include Oro Mangala and Morgan Gibbs White to an extent in that conversation as well. What were your thoughts on from the first half of the season with with those players to, to the second half? Obviously, we lost Mangala in the January, so kind of going to be a bit different, I guess. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I think towards towards the end of Cooper's tenure, we went more with a flat three, didn't we? Um, obviously, that's where we've seen Gibbs White moving out wide. Um, it's it's difficult, really. I think it it drastically improved in my eyes um, un, under Nuno. I think we were asking asking a lot of of Sangare, which obviously I know we'll, we'll come on to him. I think was asking a lot of him to be this. My my head automatically goes back to the Villa game uh, at home, and I think that's probably the best performance we've seen. Um, with our midfield three pre Nuno, um, and that was Mangala, Dominguez, and Sangare, and but Sangare was playing almost a, bo- a box to box, and we were asking him to do a job which wasn't his job. Um, I feel like we were very much just trying to get by with Cooper. I feel like obviously Cooper knew he was under a lot of pressure, uh, but then when we went to a straight rigid four two three one, which it is under Nuno, I feel like we seen certain individuals thrive like Danilo is he became vital really didn't he towards the end of the season he he really perked up after after Cooper was sacked um but yeah I think if you're comparing the two towards the end of the season I think the midfielder looked the midfield looked a lot more settled and I think we started to see the best out of certain individuals really what, what what did you see the problem with between the three in midfield that he had and then the two that Nuno went with? Because I had this argument with certain people throughout the season, people on, on the pod before, like Reese especially, that we couldn't play a two because we weren't good enough in there or we weren't fit enough or we didn't have enough runners and enough of legs or whatever. But what did you think was the major difference between those two shapes? Um, it's it's difficult really to fully fully pick it out, but the the three for me the dynamic was always wrong the dynamic was always wrong like i always like to have legs with a ball player or vice versa just I, I don't know the dynamic seemed seemed wrong for me i think we were quite wide in that three as well we weren't compact um whereas in the two you don't have a choice but to be compact um and to be fair it it almost it almost our point, the point I've just made kind of defeats whole object because I think we're better on the ball now. We're mm-hmm. better on the ball now as a team under Nuno. So the midfield kind of automatically looks better because the more comfortable in possession, they can trust each other more. Um, I don't, I, it's, it's such a tough question. Um, I've, I've kind of answered it without answering it, but it, <laughs> it, it, it is, it's such a difficult question because theoretically, you've got an extra man in there with the, with the flat three. So you should be able to dictate and control games more but we never really seem to um but like i said when it's easier to dictate a game when you've got the ball yeah <laughs> it's, it's the be all and end all i mean i mean for me it, it, from from the three it killed us because we shoe on gibbs white out wide and we all know yeah, he's not a winger. That, yeah. yeah with the two you, you you put him in 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 your best position and then you can kind of feed him the ball um statistically mm-hmm. i think w wt analysis like put this on twitter um 
that when one gives White was shoehorned out wide, he really didn't really get the ball as much as he'd like. Whereas under Nuno, he actually liked to pick the ball up left, kind of from the left, and then drift into the middle and then feed yeah. balls through that way. And I think that kind of says a lot, really, in terms of how uh, how we shaped up. He, he liked to kind of shuttle from left to right, whoever had the ball, I guess. Um, I want to go through a bit of a review of each midfielder. I know that's a bit weird and it probably it's going to probably sound harsher on some than, than most because I think from different parts of the season, you have different kind of opinion on them. Like Nico Dominguez, you barely saw him second half of the season, or you see him very like in and out of the team. Whereas at the start, he was in it quite a lot. So let's start with him. What did you make of him overall for his first season in the Premier League, coming from the Italian league? Um, for me, I'm I'm going to have to take some uh, Nico Dominguez tinted glasses off because I love him. I've always I've always like from the first from his debut, I've loved him. I've I've always really liked that style of midfielder. He's, he's nasty, and he? he's always like he's like always snatching at ankles and trying to he's, he's everywhere isn't he he's, he's literally everywhere but for me yeah the first half of the season was really good and it almost like derailed at West Ham away it was yeah. when he, he lost the ball didn't he and then was it Paqueta who scored yeah um, he have that on his bet and slip I was about to say I wonder, I wonder if he had a bet on Dominguez to pass in the ball and score that <laughs> yeah after that it was it was like it was so up and down, really, wasn't it? He was, he was almost like a bit part player. He did have a couple of little niggles where he missed games and stuff. He had the spell where he got back into the team under Nuno, where a lot were away for AFCON, but they were only really FA Cup games that he played in. So, hmm. But I think Dominguez is one of them that we'll see the best of next season. And I, yeah. I don't know whether that's wishful thinking. I've seen him linked with a move away, actually. That was very early on in the summer. I'd like to think that Dominguez is one of them that we can keep, because I do think, there's a there's a good midfield, solid Premier League midfielder in there. I mean, he's been linked with AC Milan. Um, I think he had a hernia problem as well. And I think that's maybe what kind of derailed him as well, as well as that performance at West Ham. I kind of do think that as well. Like his confidence seemed to go quite a lot. Um, I think someone that's confidence definitely has been on the floor for majority of the season is Ibrahim Sangare. And he's a huge, huge topic within this kind of overall subjects, isn't he? I mean, yeah. 35 million euros from PSV, who then have gone on to what win the Champions League and get to the knockout rounds. I kind of I wonder how he's feeling about it all. But do you do you think he's gonna be here next season, first of all? And and how do you see it going? Because I think you and I and and probably our friendship group are in the same ilk of like we really want him to do well and we think he can do well. It's just whether he gets the opportunity in it if he wants to do it, which I think he will because he's a footballer. Like at the end of the day, they've not worked hard for to to not get where they've got to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like like you you touched on then. I I would love nothing more than this man to come back and be the an absolute unit. Yeah, just be <laughs> our mate, our anchor that we thought we were buying, um, and and be that next season for us. I'd love nothing more just because. I'm a Forest fan, and all the all the I think the treatment of him has been absolutely ridiculous, and it's almost like a, a spoiled kid has got a new a new shiny toy, and the shiny toy hasn't lived up to expectations, so he's he's throwing out. For some reason, the the kid in Toy Story springs to mind. Don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what remind, that's what our fans are reminding me of with Sangare. Is I feel sorry for him in one sense, but also in another sense. He's a professional footballer. He's got to help himself. He's got to help himself. For me, from the outside looking in, it's easy to make assumptions, but it looks he looks like a player who who hasn't jumped in two feet. Mm. And it's like he's not fully. It's like he said, "Well, I'm here now, but I'm I'm still partly back in in Holland. I've had a lot of bad things happen to me. I've got that to fall back on." That's I don't know. It, that's the way it comes across. Obviously, it's more than likely not going to be that. But on the pitch, I think he started off relatively okay. Mm. Um, I think he started off okay. For some reason, again, West Ham away springs to mind. I thought it was really good. Newcastle away, I thought it was really good. Um, I think even the Villa game that we mentioned earlier when he played in a three with Mangala and Dominguez, I thought it was really good, even though he was out of position a little bit. He was playing more of a box-to-box. Um, but I think he's one of them. He needs, he needs a run of games. We've seen it happen with with Mangala. Mangala was 
getting pelters left, right and centre from Forest fans. And then all of a sudden, give him a run of games and he's our best midfielder and we've sold him for a great fee. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen with Sangari because he's someone that I'd like to see, see us grow with him, if you like, um, yeah. or him grow with us. Um, but yeah, I, it's such a difficult one with him because like I say, we've seen glimpses, but we've also not seen nowhere near enough. Um, yeah. But there, there is a player in there. There is there is a player in there. We've seen it. We played against him in pre-season. I was one of them idiots who bought the game <laughs> to watch <laughs> us play against PSV. And 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 he absolutely schooled Morgan Gibbs White that day. Schooled him. He, he, yeah. he was he was top class. And that that was when we were linked with him as well. And we were all going, "Wow, we've got we've got a player." So it is in there. I, I think he just needs a little bit of TLC, a little bit, well, a lot more backing from the fans. Yeah. Um, and a run of games. I think that's that's literally it. And, and like we, we touched on previously as well, a pre-season. Yeah. I mean, I heard he got malaria. I didn't I, I heard he got ill, but I didn't think it was that bad. And like that yeah, must take some out of you. I mean, I mean, he walked past me, you and, and Reese before a game. I can't remember which game, but him and Bali were walking through the car park and they just yeah, come back from Afghan. Yeah. And he was massive, isn't he? He's absolutely yeah. huge. And I think yeah. I've heard like I've heard players say how good he is, how how weirdly good he is with his feet how athletic he is and we have seen that from him and i think like i think you are right mason like if he gets a run of games a good like pre-season i think he's a nuno wet dream for me like you looked yeah. at the team that was so successful under nuno with martino and neves both both can get around the pitch both technically very very good players but i think i think sangari's got that thing as well where he can be a nasty bugger he's like really gangly like gets his legs wrapped around players and wins the ball when he probably shouldn't because he's got them them uh them attributes and uh things that players don't have as such. He like I think he's really got it in his locker and I think this season could be a huge redemption art for him. I really I really hope we're right and we're kind of telling everyone where the haters are next season. That'd be my yeah. my idealistic uh uh thing. Um, let's move on from Sangari. Let's 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 talk about Ryan Yates. I know, like, we love and loathe him um, a lot on this podcast. Um, you and I have both got a, an opinion of like Marmite with with Ryan Yates. But let's take that kind of like hat off and be 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 honest with him. What did you make of him this season? Oh, um, <laughs> it's such a difficult. He's an enigma, isn't he? Um, I think- I think he's very much a roller coaster, isn't he? Yeah, I think overall you could you could say he he had a good season. Hmm. He he did. Um, he did what Ryan Yates does the best, and that's cover ground, lead the team, which r- rightly or wrongly he's he's our captain. Um, I'm not saying he 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 did an amazing job, but he did lead the team. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, you know what you're going to get from him. He's not a ball-playing midfielder. He never will be. Um, we've seen the best out of him in the Championship when he had Jimmy Garner next to him. So hopefully next next season, with whether that's with a Sangari, a Danilo, or well, it, we've seen it a little bit towards the end of this season with a Danilo. But yeah, in, in terms of his, his, his season, like I say, it's, it's a bit of a roller coaster. I think certain players, you know what you're going to get from him per game. You, I don't think you ever know what you're going to get on the ball anyway from Ryan Yates. You never know. Because for some, for some reason, again, Man United at home spring into my mind. I thought he was excellent. He was um, he, he was probably the best all-rounded Ryan Yates performance, I'd say, because he was doing the stuff on the ball as well. Um yeah. he played a huge he played a huge part in the winning goal. Um I, I I thought he was really and then the next game, I can't remember who it was, but I can remember talking about it with like say you and 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 Reese. It just the levels drop again, and I think yeah. this season come in. Um, I think he's he made the most appearances in midfield for us out of our main four midfielders. And I think if we want to progress as a team, them numbers need to drop a little bit. It sounds harsh, but they do because there, there is limitations on the ball with Ryan Yates, whether we yeah, like I mean- it or not. The stats kind of back that up because, like, for a midfielder for per ninety passes, com- passes attempted thirty seven. He's the six. He's sixteenth percentile for that passes completion. It's eighty less than eighty percent at thirty one percentile. Uh, progressive passes is only three point three, which I don't expect to be high because he's not that kind of player. No. But that there, but the the first 
the first two are pretty poor for a central midfielder. But then, like, you look at his defensive work, and this is where he really shines because tackles is nearly at three at 2.98, 90th percentile. Interceptions a little bit low, but still not bad at uh, 0.95, uh, which is 53. Blocks 1.9 at 94 percentile. Clearance is 1.99, which is 86 percentile. Aerial duels won 1.85, which is 95, 90th percentile, which is pretty good. Like, and yeah. this is where his numbers should be in terms of a player. But those passing statistics are where you need them to be better, especially as we're a counter attack inside. You need the midfielders to find your ball playing players, your wingers, full backs. And that, that, those numbers aren't high enough. He's clearly given the ball away way, 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 way too much in terms of how, what he should be doing, really, in, in my opinion. Um, and I think this is where he rubs people up the wrong way because. You think, right, you're really good at winning the ball, but can you keep it? And the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no, really. And that's that's a problem. And I think yeah. that's where I get I get where people kind of lose their way in it because he does he does bleed and he does bleed Nottingham Forest at the end of the day. You can't say he doesn't. Um mm. but you can't not you but you can also still want more, can't you? Uh, yeah, I think I think as a fan base we need to kind of find a middle ground with him. I think you see the people that absolutely adore Ryan Yates. He bleeds Forrest. He's our captain. They want him, give him a lifetime contract. But then there's the people who look at him from a football perspective and they take away where he was from and whose academy he came through. And there's people that see his limitations. I think we kind of need to find a middle ground and accept him for what he is, which obviously some people will have. But I think, like I said earlier, going back to it, I think if we want to progress as a team, the next step ups are are the Wolves, even Bournemouth compared to last season. That that kind of level, so the what is it, fourteenth to to tenth is probably the next biggest step up. For I'm not saying we're going to come tenth because it's dreamland, but that's the next step up, isn't it? To to start competing with them kind of teams and and getting three three or four four more wins a season, a couple more draws and less losses, and if that's going to be the case then Ryan Yates can't be involved as much as he is he, he can't and but that's not me saying get rid of him because there is a use for right every single team in the world would want a player like Ryan Yates in their squad yeah the issue the issue for me is it shows how much we've been struggling that he's played as much as he has yeah definitely um before I get on to Danilo because he was for me he was our best midfielder last season I want to talk about Oramangala are you surprised that one that he went and two he went for as much money as he did, or or how do you see it? Both, both. To be fair, um, don't get me wrong. When he was here, a huge fan of him. I loved him. I I love ball playing midfielders. I love how good he was in tight spaces. And um, I know for a fact. Danny wouldn't agree with me because we've been at games together before where Danny's been off his seat screaming at him, release the ball, release the ball. But he was one of our only midfielders who did take that chance on the ball. He mm. played more forwards passes. And I think that's why he was probably scrutinised a little bit more because he took that chance because he trusted his own ability. And, and that's what he did have a lot of. I think for the first few weeks after we lost him, I was scratching my scratching my head thinking, who, how are we going to play without him? Because... Mm. Deep, deep line stuff. Everything went through Mangala. Yeah. Um, but yeah, is it? Don't get me wrong. Good player, Belgian international. Starts for Belgium now quite a lot of the time. Seen him start the other night. But the fee we got is you can't turn that down. You can't. And and as a club, we we're saying even the chairman's saying now, and the owner, sorry, is saying he wants to follow this Brighton model. And that is perfect for the brighter model we paid what 12 12 million euros 13 million euros and we've sold him for 25 million euros so yeah. the, that 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 fee that fee is a lot it, it, it i think it is a lot um not necessarily worth that but yeah I'd, I'd, i've got no bad no bad word to say about mangala really yeah um and then last of all danilo who i thought again started slow Kind of didn't know where what his role was, where he was going to play. So then Nuno come in, and I thought we've got we've got Danilo back, who, who like stormed the Premier League when he come in in the January. And like I think he started to really like come to terms with the Premier League and like what his role was and what his ability uh, can kind of give it, give us almost. I don't know if that's the right term term of phrase, 
but I just thought like he really take took start to take games by a little bit by the scruff of the neck. Maybe not. Maybe he needs to improve that. Maybe he needs to start dictating a little bit more. Um, he's still quite young after all. So, what was your thoughts around Danilo last season, and where do you think he can really like push push his game to the next level? Um, yeah, I think you said earlier. I think he was our best midfielder overall. Um, quite clearly as well. I think he was levels above our midfield this year. Um, for me, where he has to improve is is the last little bit of his game, not his finishing. It's his final ball. Um, because we've seen it numerous times this season. He steps forward and drives with the ball so well. So, so well. That's one of his main strengths. He's so leggy. He's so leggy. He covers a lot of the ground. His first pass is usually really good, really crisp. He's, he's, that's what I love about him. He's, he's, he's always got pictures in his head. And I feel like eventually, if we, which I would take, if we do have another couple of relegation seasons where we're battling it and we manage to stay, I think Danilo is one of them who will take a step and, and out, outgrow us eventually. Mm. Um, because I do, I do, I rate him so highly. I think he's got everything to be that perfect number eight um, for us and maybe for someone else better than us if we don't don't continue growing like at his pace. But yeah, I think his final ball, I'd like to see him get a few more assists, um, a few more goals even. He Obviously, he scored a handful last year, wasn't it? He scored in a row. Three, one. He scored like, yeah, three, three in a row or something. He had Brentford away, Brighton at home and Southampton at home. Yeah. last season uh, and then this season he's obviously chipped in with the Brentford goal which is a great goal so we know he can do it um, but yeah I think even defensively I think his defensive contributions have been quite good I don't know what he is statistic wise I don't know how he shows up on the stats but I think to the naked eye when I watch him he always seems to be near, there or thereabouts in the right position so yeah nothing yeah, well, but, but praise F, F breath if you, want, if you want to call it that, fbref.com. Um, so if anyone wants to check out, you can look at loads of players. It's great um, for stat nerds like us, Mason. Um, <laughs> defensively, very good, like 1.81 per game, which is only the 38th percentile. So he's not really a tackler, This, but this is where I think he, he really shines. Interceptions, 1.76. He's 94th percentile. Blocks, 1.66, which is 89th percentile. Clearances. 2.11 at 91. I think this is where, again, I think this is probably the story of all of our midfielders. The passing attempts and completion rate is really, really low. 38, and then he's only completing 77%, um, which is poor. But then his progressive passes is a lot higher at over four point four for a game. Um, I think this is where Nuno might want to change in terms of how we keep the ball because we do we are a counter attack inside at the end of the day, but those passes have got to be better. But if we're if we was one of the best, we was one of the best attack, attacking sides in the league on counter attacking in Europe. We were like sixth highest, weren't we, with goals? But if we want to improve on that, I do think like we need to look after the ball a lot better and know when to kind of counter attack because sometimes it can kind of almost be a little bit aimless. Like we try and do the eye of the needle sort of pass all the time. And I think like we can be a lot more patient and we can be a lot more clever with, with certain things. And I think you, you've kind of touched on it at the start of the start of the show with we're a bit, we're playing a rigid four, two, three, one. I don't know how like you kind of don't make that rigid because I think that shape is so important in, in, in that, that formation, but I'm sure Nuno, if he if he is still here throughout the summer, we'll work on that because I think he was starting to work on it in Saudi where players were doing all sorts of stuff. I mean, Alaina will have a field day coming in field and, <laughs> and being like an extra mm -hmm. midfielder, I think. You're just just vibing. Um but yeah, I think Danilo is is the one that you kind of look to now and say, like, you've been here now two year or well, year and a half. But I still think you can say to him, like, put a bit more um give him a bit more responsibility in that sense. Um, if you put him next to Sangari, he can because he's yeah. got the energy, hasn't he? And we saw it yeah. against um, Newcastle. was it Newcastle away, and then yeah. a man, and and uh, we well, didn't play in the Man United game because Sangari got um, suspended, didn't he? And then went to Afcon. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a partnership between them two that could definitely happen. But I did want to talk about uh, a link to midfield that we've got in Florentino Luis. I think we was linked to him last season, and um, it kind of bodes well because we've brought in Pedro Ferreira as the head of recruitment who's come from Benfica was there for 13 or 14 years 
what what have you, have you? I don't know if you've looked up Florentino Lewis. I'm not going to pretend I understand. I know really much about him because I don't watch the Portuguese league and didn't really watch Benfica in the Champions League. But what do you make to that link? First of all, yeah. To, to be fair, like like you like you just said, I'd, I've never really watched Portuguese football. I'm not going to act like I watch Benfica week in week out. But from <clears throat> from the background of mine, which is which is FIFA, <laughs> this is sorry, right? <laughs> he's, he's, he's he's always been. A wonder kid on FIFA. So as soon as his name popped up, I knew his name instantly. Um, I've done a little bit of digging, a little bit of research since. And to me, it's it's a strange signing. Don't get me wrong, I'd welcome it. Don't get me wrong. But because I, I'd love to see his stats on, on the website you've just mentioned now. I'm not going to try and say it. Um, because to me, it just looks like we've just spent 30 million on 35 million euros on Sangare. Are we then going to go and do the same again on someone who will play a very similar role? Mm. Um, don't get me wrong. If Sangari goes, don't want that to happen. But if he does, I'm I'm more than for it. I'm more than for it. I just I, th- I think we do lack a a destroyer in there. Uh, don't get me wrong, like a centre central defensive midfield player, and that's what he looks like he is. Because by the looks of things, he's not necessarily a ball player, is he? Um, and, and going off all what we've just spoke about, the one thing we do need is a ball player. We don't necessarily need someone who's gonna who's gonna do the Sangare well because we've, we've got Sangare. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's a strange one. Well, yeah, because his 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 passing is way better than anyone in our midfield. But Benfica are a team that dominate in in, in in the Portuguese league, aren't they? It's like I mean, passes come passes attempted is seventy three a game per ninety, which is at ninety seven percentile. Pass completion eighty eight point nine, which is at the ninety fourth percent. Our progressive pass is seven point six one. That's because they have the ball so often, and it, they, they're playing against far weaker opposition than than they are compared to their league. And it, and then again, his defensive statistics are so so high. Like what tackles four point two three ninety nine percent. Our interceptions two point six three ninety nine percent. Like do you know what I mean? It, he, he is at the top of like the food chain in his league. So yeah. I completely. I can completely get it, but I'm in I'm in the same kind of boat as you. Like he's similar to what we've already got. We've already got three players there already. I mean, I haven't looked at Dominguez, but Dominguez is more of a box to box kind of you go close things down. But the other three are very similar in terms of their defensive attributes. I think Sangari is the one who can help with the ball playing and kind of start dictating games a little bit more. But at the end of the day, and I keep reiterating this, Forest are a counter-attacking team and never have been anything different in my lifetime, in, in my opinion. They've never been a tiki-taka kind of let's keep the ball. No, it's get the ball forward, let's get the ball quick forward quickly. I'd like to see a midfielder that will kind of get a few more goals for us personally. I think yeah. we only had like 13 different goal scorers last season. Majority of them were the, the forward line and then like the odd one got chipped in by Danilo, Yates and Dominguez and then like someone from the back line. I think we need someone from midfield that will go and score goals and that's why I wanted someone like, I know Gabriel Sara at Norwich plays predominantly a bit more further forward, but someone that will score more goals from midfield. Yeah, 100%. I don't know. So that, that, that's what it is for me. But I mean, what, what, what do you make of, of Nuno's style of play in general anyway, compared to the rest of the league? Do you think it suits us? Do you think it's it could be better? Um, I, th- I think I think he does suit us to a T. I think that is the reason why he was hounded to, to come and replace Cooper, because there wasn't necessarily going to be drastic changes. There was always, always going to be tweaks. No manager is exactly the same. Um I, I do I do like his style of play. Like I say, I think it suits us. We've got pace on the break. We've got we've got legs in midfield. Um, that's one of our main strengths in midfield is is legs. Um, yeah, I think it really. We've even got attacking pacey fullbacks. Um, like he must absolutely love Olerena and Nico Williams. He must absolutely love them because the ground they cover at pace is is ridiculous. So, in terms of his style of play, like like you touched on earlier, in Saudi, he, he was doing all sorts of crazy circus stuff. It was absolutely nuts. Like, I read that article when when he, he was going to join us, and I was thinking, oh, my word. Like, I, I can remember saying in our chat, he's going to have Mangala at right back, playing centre midfield, dropping into centre back and doing all sorts of crazy things. <laughs> but I think, to be honest, I think we did see 
certain certain little tweaks of that with especially with the fullbacks. I think Nuno Tavares springs to mind when he played. He I, I've got visions of him driving quite centrally with the ball. Brentford away, he did it quite a lot. Um, a couple of home games where I know he had a couple of wild right foot shots. He was central. Um, yeah. So there is there is time. I think a goal away at Tottenham came from a Nico Williams underlapping run with Elanga. Yeah. Um, Williams was more in field than our winner. So there is little tweaks that that I can see happening. I think once he's had a pre season, because it, it's it's a lot a, a lot harder to work on that stuff in the season when there's three points at stake. But when he's got time time on his hands, I think this is why I'm so Nuno in because we've seen that when he hasn't really had time to work on it. He's got a long pre-season ahead of him coming in a few weeks where he can work on all, all styles of play and tiny little changes. I think next season we'll, we'll see a very similar forest, but there will be a lot more tactical changes. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm for Nuno and, and I can see why we went for him. Did you like, cause I thought, especially like once he came in and I know like it was very early on, but I felt like we looked more like a premier league team. We looked like we were a bit more confident. We had a bit more swagger. I know you can get that with like a new manager bounce, but even in the games there where we we lost or we we um, we we were like kind of drew or whatever, with the weren't positive results. We still looked like a team that was capable and was always in the game. Whereas under Cooper, I just never had that kind of feeling. I just always thought if we went one nil down, were we ever going to come back? Uh, with Nuno, it it happened. Sometimes, but quite a few times, it happened where we we did come back. We got a point, or we got a win. Actually, um, I felt more like people knew what they were doing a little bit more. We weren't sitting so deep. We weren't in a low block and just defending for our lives. You know what I mean? Like against City at home, how good was that? Like it was yeah. unbelievable. Like our midfield completely dominated theirs, and I never thought that one. I never thought I'd see Rodri get ran over in midfield by Gibbs, White, Danilo, and. And Ryan Hayes, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think up until the like, 70s, I know, I know it's one. I know, I know it's one man, but he is like universal soldier after all. Like Rodri, he's just <laughs> he's just an absolute machine. So it's a compliment to him, three against one. Um, but yeah, like I, I just thought Nuno had the experience of being in the league, and I think it just really, really told in it. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, like like you just touched on them. There's there's certain games where especially at the beginning, even the Bournemouth game that we lost, well, we got done by the referee with, with the Bolly red card. I was at that game and I was watching, I was thinking, this looks like a different team. It look, There's tiny little tweaks that might, might not be visible to to everyday people. Like, But we're looking at it and it, it, it's just got this now tactically, I think, that Cooper didn't have, which pains me to say, because obviously I, lo- I love Steve Cooper, always will do, but I think... Cooper is probably a Dwight Gale in terms of footballer. He's in, he's in between the Championship and the Premiership, isn't he? But, whereas I feel like Nuno is probably a lower level Premier League striker if he was. Obviously, I know he was a goalie. But in terms of in terms of managerial, tactical and and even man management, because Cooper wasn't getting a tune out of a lot of our players. And like we touched on, Danilo was incredible since Nuno came in. Ola Aina was Ola Aina all season, but he, he even he hit a new high. Obviously, Chris Wood is the main one under Nuno. All, all of a sudden, all these players are, are, are producing great performances week in, week out. Mm. At Premier League level performances, should we say. So, yeah. Uh, and, and you can even say the same about Gibbs White. Although Gibbs White, at the end of the first season, did start to produce like more goals and assists. I do think he had... I know, you, I know you, he like... You pull our hair out about Morgan Gibbs White because you because you want him to be like the the main man, the talisman to take the ball by the horns as such. But he did make he did make the one move which has put him in his best position, and I think we saw the better of him more often than than, than we did before when he was getting shoe horned out wide. I just felt like Nuno really helped himself in that aspect. He didn't help himself in some terms of like certain substitutions, playing like Divock Arig every week who was an yeah. absolute car crash but I think majority of the time he got it right and te- technically we survived 10 points with 10 points more than, than Luton at the end of the day I, I don't care how, how you look at it we did so I think there is definite progression there um, I'm pretty excited about next season um, 
I always am because I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, how, how how do you think it will? I know we'll probably you'll probably come back on and we'll talk about this anyway. But early early thoughts for for next season. Oh, it's difficult. Um, Especially ideally, with no, no transfers, you can't really say. Yeah, can you? I know it's yeah, difficult. But, it, but ideally, you'd like to think we make that we make that step up into the next mini league. Um, for me, like it's it's fairly obvious looking at the league. It's mini leagues. Um, and we've been in the bottom one for the last two seasons. I'd like to see us make make that step up into the next one and and compete with with Wolves. Palace is a bit of a bad example at the moment because they they hit heights that no one thought they ever would towards yeah. the end of last season. But the Wolves, the Bournemouth, um, even Everton, th- them kind of teams. If we can compete with them kind of teams, which I think is where we fail, we fail to do so. Like them three teams I just mentioned, did we did we beat one of them this season? I don't think we did. No. I don't think we did now. So even if you if you win one win one at home and you lose one away, it, it propels you up the up the table that a little bit more at the end. So yeah, I think for me, my, the aim would be, and what I'd like us to do is is to just climb a couple of places, get a couple more wins, a couple more draws, and all of a sudden you're looking you're looking cozy with with five five six games to go. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's what we'll we'll leave it there, Mason. Um, I'm sure there'll be more to talk about as as the summer goes and more links and you know what the circuit.